Good morning, everyone. It's a blessing and privilege to see so many brothers and sisters in Christ gathered together. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel I just don't get any respect. It happened last year at the Ozark. I was giving uh, the privilege of a sermon opportunity down at the Feast of the Ozarks last year. A lady was seated evidently quite far back in the auditorium, and she came up to me after my sermon, and she said, Oh! I've never been greeted like that before. And then she commenced to say, you're, you're a little heavier than what I thought you were when I saw you in the back. I said, yes, yeah, I didn't think I was that heavy. but." Uh, and then, of course, I went to a barber before I came up here when I was down in Illinois to speak here at the feast and to be here at the feast. And I mentioned to the barber that I wanted to look as my best and try to have a good presentation and I naturally have straight hair so he cut my hair and uh, I said well you know I get a little nervous I don't want it falling in front of my eyes and so forth he said well I'll tell you what we uh, come up with a new chemical that we can put on your hair your straight hair and keep it into place and it'll just stay that way uh, for, for many days and I said well I think I want that give me that new chemical treatment then he said however there's one drawback with this chemical and I said what's that he said well if it gets below 40 degrees your hair will curl <laughs> I didn't think it would being up here in Wisconsin Dells this time of the year even though I've been up here for many years but I was wrong about that I don't seem to get much respect either I've got to tell you one more incident that happened to me. I got my reservations, my confirmation, my reservation, just like most of you did before I arrived up here. And uh, my reservation, I, I got a little bit, uh, I got a little bit wondered a little bit about it. Usually in the ministry, we get our reservations last, maybe three or four or five days, which is fine before we come up. Take care of the people first. The ministry can be last, and that's fine with me. However, I got my reservations or my confirmation very early this year. Now, the name of the motel where we were going to be staying kind of put me off a little bit. You know, I didn't think, well, you know, it's, you can name a motel whatever you want. But uh, And then in with the packet of the uh, confirmation was a map of how to get to this motel. And the last leg of the directions included one of these ducks you take. <laughs> the name of the motel is John's Dinghy. Now, I didn't, you know, I said I was a little, you know, I queried it. I wondered why they would name a motel like that until I got there and found out all there is is a John and a dinghy. <laughs> so I decided I don't want to be a complainer. Sometimes that is my nature. I do complain a little bit too much. So I decided I would call housing office, Mr. Dick. I know this Mr. Ray did quite well, and I would use my name, you know, and say, well, this is Jess Ernest calling. He said, well, you know, things are kind of tight here. We have a lot of people coming, and uh, if you don't like John's dinghy, we have Breeze Inn. I said, no, thank you. I'll stick with John's dinghy. <laughs> now, I'm just jest, jesting with you. I think you realize, and I certainly appreciate all the work Mr. and Mrs. Ray Dick do, spending many weeks and months prior to our coming here to Wisconsin Dells, trying to make all the reservations for us and all the accommodations. And we do have a number of brethren here this year. I, I, don't, I didn't get the figure. It's 8,000 plus. I think I'm conservative to say that. 8,000 plus here this year, whereas uh, Mr. Dick mentioned the first two years, we had quite a few thousands of people, thousands of people here, maybe 10,000 the first two years, and thereafter it dropped way down, down, I don't know, five, six, seven, and now back up again this year. I'll tell you a little about myself and some of the lack of respect that I get sometimes. I'm wondering how you're doing. This is the sixth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm wondering if you think about all the sermons you've heard here, and I've heard every one of them and every sermonette. And even as a servant of God, I did not hear one that I couldn't get something out of, that every sermon reiterated certain thoughts to me, certain concepts, introduced some new ones to me, and helped me to think a little bit more, amuse a little bit more about my Christian life. And so I appreciate those. Also, the fellowship I've been able to have and the good food. So I hope as you think about all these things in your life, even though the weather may not be the most conducive, certainly it's not going to rain on our parade or our feast. We're still going to worship God and obey Him and come get a spiritual feast, even though we can't have certain things in the physical realm. I'm wondering how you're doing today. Maybe you could evaluate 
already the sixth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, how well you're doing by the smile you can give me. Now, give me that smile to show me how well you're doing after six days. That's it. Put it all in a smile. Wonderful. Isn't that beautiful? Nine thousand smiles. Two frowns, a yawner, and a sleeper. Those people are all staying at John's dinghy. That's probably why. Now at home, when we're living in our normal dwellings, we all have different professions. And I think that's good and fine that we should be varied in our personalities and uh, the different vocations that we do have and different professions. Let's see now by a show of hands what we can discern here about our different professions. Let's see by a showing of hands who's in the construction trade. Any aspect, would you raise your hand? Construction, you know, carpenters, electricians, masons, whatever. Raise your hand and wave them a little bit. That's a construction uh, trade. Very good. How about clerical work? Secretaries, typists, file clerks, whatever else you want to call them. Clerical work. Very good. How about mechanical, auto or diesel mechanics? Any mechanics here? Oh, we have some. Good. How about the teaching profession, be administrative or a teacher? How many do we have in that fine profession? All right, we have some of those. How about housewives, a profession all of its own? Housewives. Oh, wonderful. Not a few. How about self-employed people? Self-employed. Having your own business. Good. Quite a few of those also. You can see as you look around, we represent many professions here, physical professions. So we have, you know, that in common anyway, that we all have jobs. But as Christians, all of us have, if I can put it this way, as Christians, all of us have two professions. Two professions as Christians are two specific jobs to do as Christians. The first one is to help Mr. Herbert Armstrong get out the gospel as a warning and a witness via our prayers, our tithes, and our offerings. Right? That's one of our professions, one of our jobs that we're doing as Christians. And the second job is also very important. And that is... We all have as a personal profession to build godlike character. To build godlike character. We cannot do that one on anyone else's apron strings. Mr. Armstrong will not do that for you. Neither will any of God's servants. Neither will God himself or Jesus Christ or angels do that for you or for me. That we have to do of our own selves, coupled with God's help via the Holy Spirit. We have that as a profession as Christians to build Godlike character. Now we've heard this word character. I've had four. I've heard it four or five times during the feast this year. That the ministers of God have talked to us about different aspects of this subject of building character. Now building Godlike character is one of the basic. Doctrines of the church. And I think you're aware of that as you find in Hebrews chapter 6. My question today is this. Why does God want us to build character? Why, brethren? Why does God want you males and females, ministers and laity alike, why does God want us to build character? I think it's important enough to give a sermon on it, and that's the reason I'm giving it today. It would be so easy as Christians if God would not require us to do anything, wouldn't it? It would be just so easy to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and do nothing. It would be so easy. Now, I liken the analogy, and I don't mean anything against those in the world because those are the ones we're going to love in the future and serve and help. To speak against them in a sense would be slapping our own face. So I'm not speaking against them. However, once in a while I guess we get a little indignant at mainstream quote unquote Christianity. Mainstream Christianity where they claim they're doing certain things and they're not. And I get a little indignant and a little uptight once in a while when I hear people say about what they believe and so forth when really as an analogy, and I don't mean it against them, really as an analogy, someone who is so-called a Christian 
compared to us who God has enlightened and opened our minds to be producers. If you want to use the analogy, it's like a man running a mile race, hurdle race. The gun has already sounded for the Christian. He has already embarked upon the race. He has already run a half mile of that mile and jumped maybe 10 or 12 hurdles where the other so-called Christian is in the locker room looking for his gym shorts. He's not going to win the race. I would put no money and give the man no odds that he would win that race when he's back in the locker room looking for his gym shorts compared to the true Christian who has been enlightened by God and knows he or she must produce. And so I think it's kind of laughable in one sense and yet it's kind of ironic in another. In another way it kind of hurts a little bit to see people claim they are certain things when they aren't. And that really hurts. But these are the same people we're talking about that we're going to have to love and share our lives with and be concerned for them to help them do the same thing we're doing and to embark upon the same race that we're running ourselves and we have been running depending on how many years you've been converted. Whether it's one, three, five, eight, fifteen, or twenty years, we've been running that same race, building that character for God. So let's define the word character. We've heard about it quite a bit today. Not today, but I mean during the feast. One man, I think, gave us part of a definition of the word character. So let's define this word character to make sure we all clearly understand what I'm talking about. Now, I got this first definition from Webster's New 20th Century Dictionary, unabridged. It says this about the word character. It's a distinctive trait, quality, or attribute, an individual's pattern of behavior. Notice that again. An individual's pattern of behavior or personality, moral constitution, self-discipline, as we heard in the sermonette about developing proper habits, having self-discipline, fortitude, reputation, having a reputation. Now my simple, yet I think meaningful definition of Christian character is simply this. To know what is right and to force yourself to do that right. I hope you'll jot that down because I think it's a very important little phrase or sentence. To know what is right and to force yourself to do that right. There are some important things to understand in that sentence. There are two things to know and to do. You cannot do if you do not know. You can know, but maybe you don't do. So it means to know here, to have it in your computer here, to have the knowledge there, to know, and then to have the character to do. Also, you notice in my definition, I use the word force. Because human nature being what it is and mind being what it is, we have to force ourselves to do right, don't we? And I think we've noticed that over the years as Christians for as long as we've been in God's church. Now, first of all, I want us to think now in regard to character, and later on I'll answer the question for you why God wants us to build character. I want us to think, first of all, about God the Father himself and Jesus Christ. We want to focus our attention on comparing, as it were, and we will in a few minutes, some beings with God the Father and Jesus Christ. We pray to the Father, we pray to Jesus Christ, but yet we've never seen them. We communicate to them, yet we've never heard from them. So we, through faith, believe in the Father and Jesus Christ the Son, even though we don't know them by our, our physical minds, by the senses where the knowledge is taken into the body through the five senses. We don't even know God that way. That's the reason the ingredient of faith is so crucial to a Christian. If someone would say to you, prove me God, show me God, let me hear God, let me taste God, let me smell God, I'd say, well, I can't do that for you. I'll show you God here. And I said, no, you didn't show me God. You showed me a book. I said, well, no, I'll tell you all about God through the book. Well, I don't want any book. I see that book. I've got that book myself. I want to see God. Well, you can't. So it takes faith and belief and trust that God exists. And some of the greatest proof to me about God's existence is me. And I hope that doesn't sound in any sense you know, derogatory against God, but the greatest proof to me about God is me. Because how did I get here to start with? And how did you get here? 
And you know, you take the root of, uh, of evolution, you know, you'd have to have an awesome amount of faith to believe that, wouldn't you? When you really look at it with a critical eye, you'd have to have an awesome amount of faith to believe that. I can see the change in my life over 17 years of God working with me, and to me that's one of the most tangible proofs that God exists by my life and the way I'm living it and trying to yield my life to Jesus Christ. And I know the person I was and the young man that I was years ago, 16, 17, even beyond, maybe 18, 20 years ago, I know the type of young man I was, and I was not very happy with that. I was, you know, as long as I was unconverted, but when God got a hold of me, I was very unhappy about that. So I think about God, I think about the love God has because he created the whole universe. I think about God from the point of view that he created the earth and everything that's on the earth. And I know the potential God has for mankind. So I think about God and how awesome God is and how loving, how gentle, how kind God really is. I want to read to you uh, tomorrow what it will be like. Mr. Armstrong's book just out. I just got it to what yesterday after services. The last pages here, pages 101 and 102, just want to read parts of this to you about Mr. Armstrong as God's apostle describing Jesus Christ, one of the two beings in the Godhead family. It says, Christ the King of Kings, perfect in character. Now, how, how do you visualize perfection in character? It's almost like trying to visualize eternity in the past. You cannot do it because you have a governor right up here. There's a governor on your mind, just like on mine, and you can't visualize eternity in the future any more than I can. How do you visualize God being perfect? Well, the only thing you can think about is God not doing any wrong. But what does that mean? God doesn't do any wrong. How perfect is God? We are limited, brethren, with our minds, and God created as such, that we can only have concepts about perfection. Can you sit where you're seated now? Can you be perfect for five seconds? Well, I guess so. I mean, you know, if you're alert, if you're listening, if you're not sinning, if you're not lusting, if you're not uh, hungering after something you shouldn't be hungering after, if your mind isn't drifting off somewhere, you can be perfect for five seconds. Would you give it ten? Yes, I would. Would you give it a minute? I would. Would you give it ten minutes? I would. I'd give it an hour. I'd give it a day. But how long can you be perfect? Not too long, can you? Because the human nature is vulnerable to mistakes and falling short of the mark. But God is not. And I can't comprehend that. Because I can't be perfect day after day after day, and neither can you. Not in this state, not in this life I can't. But God can, and that I cannot comprehend. But I try. Nevertheless, I try. Christ, the King of Kings, perfect in character, absolute in honesty. And later we'll have something to say about our character toward the end of the sermon. But we're looking at Jesus Christ, our perfect example now. He's absolute in honesty and in integrity, faithfulness, loyalty, and trust, filled with outgoing concern for the governed, their welfare, and salvation, total knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, complete love, mercy, patience, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, Yet, possessing total power and never compromising one millionth of an inch with his perfect law, which is the way of love. So that's Jesus Christ who is perfect and that he obeys his father perfectly, is in perfect harmony with his father, does not speak against his father, does not gossip nor complain, but does everything perfectly. And I muse on that and I think about that and I say, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to be like God? And to be perfect like God is perfect, like the Father is in Jesus Christ. Now let's compare some beings with God the Father and with Jesus Christ, the only two so far in the God family. Let's compare some beings and see what we can notice about the subject of character in, with these different people or different beings. Let's notice Ezekiel chapter 28. I think those of you who have been in the church a number of years will probably think right away, let's see, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, those are parallel scriptures, which they are. Ezekiel chapter 28, we find that Christ inspired Ezekiel to write about Lucifer, who later became Satan, and he wasn't talking about the king of Tyre, 
even though it's couched in those terms, so I guess people would read and not understand and fall backwards and slip and not understand what God has in store for us or understand really a lot of the basic truths of the Bible. This is Ezekiel chapter 28, starting in verse 12, in the middle of the verse, verse 12, where it says, and God says this now, Ezekiel wouldn't have known this himself because he wasn't around in the Garden of Eden. You seal up the sum full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Well, that's a wonderful compliment, isn't it? You seal up the sum of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You've been in the garden, or the Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And he delineates and lists all these different stones. And he says toward the end of verse uh, 13, The workmanship of your tablets and the pipes were prepared in you in the day that you were created. You are the anointed cherub that covers, because he did help cover the very throne of God. And I've set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God, and you walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in the day in, in your ways from the day that you were created. And he was perfect in a sense because God didn't create anything not perfect. But, however, we find out later on that Satan, or Lucifer, I'm sorry, Lucifer, and we'll find out about the angels, were given a choice. They were given a free moral agency also. You were perfect in the ways in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. So now we find a problem here. He was given a choice, and the choice was evidently start thinking about himself in a little different terms than what God had in store. By the multitude of your merchandise have you filled the midst of you with violence, and you have sinned. You've gone against me, Lucifer. I created you a certain way, and I instructed you, and I told you what you should be doing. But you've gone against me. You've sinned against me, Lucifer. You sin, therefore I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will not destroy, but I will dispel you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by the reason of your brightness. Now I think it's interesting to notice here in Ezekiel that one of Satan's big problems and hang-ups was his beauty. And we're not going to turn to Isaiah 14, but you're familiar with that, where there the problem wasn't so much the beauty. Now, he's still talking about the same being. The problem was not the beauty. The problem there was the ego involved in the vocation. God, I'll knock you off of your throne, and I'll be there, and I'll be the one in charge. And so we look at humankind today. We look at us, and we find out that this being who interjects moods and thoughts within our minds and we have receivers to receive that what do we find extent today and has always been since Adam and Eve's time I'm sure what do we find indicative of women generally now I know there may be exceptions I know that but I'm speaking in general terms what do we find in general about women starts with a V it's called vanity of beauty vanity of beauty girls we have it don't we now, maybe not every one of you, but it seems to be a trend among the female species how nice and dead and there I am and how pretty and every little hair's in place and every little mm, mm, mm here and there is all set. And I walk around, I hope they notice me, but don't wrestle, but just notice me. See, that we get from the being called Satan. Now, fellas, it's your turn. It's your turn. See, now we have to go over to Isaiah and we find out the male ego in vocations and jobs I'm important if you want to know how much just ask me and I'll tell you see the male ego is so busy in climbing the ladder I'm not number three I'm number two and eventually I'll be number one see jockeying for position I'm the foreman on the job I'm the supervisor here I'm the manager of this place see not wrong to improve and, and do as well as you can with your talents absolutely not but the tendency is there among the males because we got that broadcast, you see, from that being called Satan. As men, we get that, you see, that we've got to be important. I'm giving the sermon. I'm not giving the sermonette. See? I'm leading songs three days this time, not four. But I'd like to. Or whatever. And so we men get that. And we have to wrestle with that. And we got it from this being right here. And we know that. He interjects that. Now let's go over to Revelation chapter 12 and notice some other beings. We haven't gotten down to the physical level yet. We're still talking about 
this being changed his name, God changed his name from Lucifer to Satan. We find he has some cohorts, but they weren't called that at first. They were angels, ministering spirits of God, created to do a job that God wanted them to do. Revelation chapter 12, let's pick up this principle here in verse 3 and 4 and 9. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. His tail drew the third part of the stars. Revelation 1.20 tells us as the Bible, in most cases, not always, but in most cases, interprets itself. Some cases we still don't know about every jot and tittle of prophecy, but in this case it tells us that stars are angels. So he drew a third of the angels of heaven, and the dragon stood before the woman which is ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. You know, see, he didn't want to do any good. He wanted to do damage and harm and to hurt. Skipping down to verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. The old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He's not trying to enlighten the world about God's way. He wants to deceive us. Deceive from what? Well, from God's way to his way, of course. The whole world, he was cast out of the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So the point I want us to understand is they didn't have the proper character when God created them and gave them a job. They rejected that job and they didn't have the proper character to obey God and they were allowed to be around Lucifer for, I don't know, you can't use the word time. We don't, they didn't have time in those days. What do you mean time? And those experiences, they were around that being and he got to them eventually. He got to them eventually and corrupted their minds from God's perfect way to the way of yet. And let's go ahead and take it ourselves and look how good looking we are anyway, come to think of it. We're all so beautiful, so intelligent. We'll bump these people off, God and, uh, and the law of God's the spokesman and uh, Michael and Gabriel and some of the other. And we'll bump them off and we'll run the show. We'll be in charge here. And God did not like that. But God usually does not waste anything. So Satan and the demons are being used today. God doesn't waste things. So they're going to be used, and they're being used now for a particular purpose. And I'm sorry about the things they're doing, and I hope you are too. And we studied a little about this being called Satan not too long ago on the Day of Atonement, didn't we? And we found out his plan, and God is using him in his master plan for mankind. So the angels were not obedient to God, and they became demons. Now the other angels that are still loyal to God are still called angels, and they still do their job. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 now and compare some more beings. Now we get on the physical level of man. In Genesis chapter 1, and we'll find out about Adam and Eve now. Let's find in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 26, and we read this quite a few times, and I never apologize for reading God's Word. I've read it many times. I'm going to read it some more probably over the years, and I'll always read God's Bible as long as I'm converted and as long as I want to be like God. That's the only way God talks to us, or I should say the basic way God talks to us is by when we read His Bible. We talk to God through prayer, and He talks to us via the Bible, via the written word, and Mr. Armstrong writes, and his servants write to us, plain truth, good news, or whatever, articles, and when God's ministers speak to us, that's the basic way God speaks to us today. God does not appear, although I would think it'd be nice if he would, and we could see God and talk to him. That's not in his plans right now. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, verse 27. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have control, dominion, or power over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. He didn't create us like a bunch of cows. We don't look like cows. We don't look like snakes. Uh, we don't look like skunks or elephants. We look like God looks. Just like he looks like, only we're in the physical, of course, and he's in the spiritual realm. And isn't it interesting just how we look? You look around and see that we're all basically the same, yet we're all different. And we only have one head. I don't see people with two heads. You know, one head and, you know, the torso and the limbs and so forth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. 
So we understand that very clearly. Then down to verse 31. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. <clears throat> Why do you suppose it was good? Because God, as a creator, does not create anything inferior. God never makes mistakes. Remember, God is perfect. And so physical man was perfect, and he functioned anatomically perfectly. You know, we know how to eat and sleep. We have to go to the bathroom, you know, and the body function, it just works just real fine. As long as we're healthy and obey God's law, the body functions real well on a physical plane. <clears throat> so God created the man, the male and the female. He saw what he did, and he said, Behold, it's very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now we have to turn over to chapter 2 here, skip on to chapter 2. <clears throat> In verse 15, we find this being, this, <clears throat> this Adam, this clay man, as he's called, we find God's instruction to him. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So he wasn't to be a bum to lie around and, you know, just do his own thing. He had a job to do. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat, or you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now let's go back again, again here. There was a being called Lucifer. He was given a specific job to do. He did that job, but then he rebelled and refused to obey God. Then we find angels God had created, whether he created them all at one time or a thousand now and ten thousand next year and twenty thousand the following year. I don't know. I wasn't there. Neither were you. and You don't know either. But anyway, he created angels and they were given free moral agency and most of them, two thirds of them stayed faithful to God and one third decided not to obey God. And then we find, as God had, not time, but there's no such thing as time, but as experience went by. God could look things over and analyze things and talk to Jesus Christ and the Father having concourse of conversation going back and forth and decide on what are we going to do here. We're going to create a clay man, human being. He is going to be capable of death, of dying. We still want some beings to develop character. And we, we, we can see now very clearly what this Lucifer did, and we had to change his name to Satan. We saw what the angels, the third of them did, called demons, what they did. Now let's take it on a physical plane and see what we can do with the clay men, the clay people, vulnerable to death, corruptible, physical. Let's see what we can do with them. Now let's think it over before we create them now. What do you think we should do about this, that, and the other thing? And I'm sure they thought it over. God doesn't make mistakes, remember? They thought it over and devised a plan for us. That shows some of God's love to include us in that plan. So then they created the man, and then God gave him an assignment, just like he had given other beings assignments, but they rebelled, rebelled eventually, gave him an assignment. Now he said here, now look, I want to put you in this garden here. I want you to notice, Adam, I created all this for you. You didn't have to do it. But now once I've created for you, you have work to do. You have to tell it. You know, you have to uh, dung it, as it were, and water it, and take care of it. You have a job to do. Keep it nice and neat. Do your part. Would you, Adam? Oh, sure, God, I'll do that. Yes, sir, God, I'll do that. And Adam was really, God was real happy with Adam. Oh, boy, hey, here's a guy he's going to do all right here. And then, of course, he was lonely, and he needed a helpmate, so God created Eve. And, boy, his eyes lit up, and he saw Eve. Woo! He was real excited about Eve, because this is going to be a helpmate for Adam. And she didn't look like any of these other animals, you know? And she walked on her feet. Boy, what feet she had, too. Wow. Kind of like one of the ministers talking about his wife, uh, you know, put her cold feet on his back. I wish my wife would. I can't even find her feet in bed. But anyway, getting back to our story, we don't want to digress too far here. <clears throat> anyway, Adam saw the species and he liked what he saw. And uh, he said, God, you are good. You're better than I thought because here you give me a helpmate and someone to care and help me and I'll help her and she'll help me and the two of us will be one. See, we'll work together as a unit. This is good, God. I, I like this. And God told Christ, well, look, look here what we have here. Look, this is good. Here we have the two of them. They seem to be getting along. They seem to be doing their job and so forth. But then what happened? See, man, in order to build the character, let's go back to the definition, 
You must know what is right, and then you must do the right. See, not just know, you must know and then do the right. So God set it up for a little bit of a test now, a little trial to see what would happen. So we find out in chapter 3 what happened. Now the serpent was more subtle because he liked to lie. That's why he was subtle, because he didn't come out and call a spade a spade, an ace an ace, a deuce a deuce, and this is it and this is that. He lied and would go around the bush on different comments. So he wouldn't come out and declare himself. Satan's way is subtle because he does not declare himself. He'll give you half truths and half lies. Just like I've noticed in the ministry over the years about some of the brothers of mine in the ministry who left us, who would not declare themselves openly that they would not obey and support Mr. Abraham, so I would never say that. They would be very subtle. I'm wondering about his age. I wonder about his hearing, his eyesight. I, I wonder. They didn't come out and say anything. See, subtle. I just wonder. I say, are you, are you being disowned? Oh, no! Oh, no! I'm just loyal. No, no way! No! I just said I wondered about his age. That's all I said. See, interjecting thoughts. I just wondered about his age, his hearing, his sight. I just wonder, you know, how, how long his naps are in the afternoon? You know, does he sleep 12 hours a night and so forth? And I would come back and say, well, now, wait a minute. Let, let's, let's, let me see if I understand something here. Are you saying that, you know, you, you're not going to obey Mr. Armstrong and you're not going to be loyal to God's... Oh, I didn't say that! I said, well, you told me that twice, but you still come at me with these comments, and I don't quite understand it. Well, now I do understand Satan's way is to be subtle. He doesn't just come out. Now, I know later on, eventually, I guess if you provoke it long enough, then finally you might provoke the person to come out with a true attitude. But usually it's, it's kind of innuendos, running around the mulberry bush, and not being declarative and be really telling exactly how you feel. So here, this serpent here now, where Satan is using the serpent, was more subtle because he didn't tell the truth than any of the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, and notice his attitude and his approach, Yes, yes, sir, boy, this is wonderful. God is so good. He started on the positive. Yes, sir, isn't this wonderful to be living now? Breathe that air a little bit. Oh, boy, doesn't that feel good? Boy, doesn't it feel good to live? Oh, it sure does. See, all that isn't written there. That's in First Ernest 2.7. But he talked to him on the positive. Yes, sir, it sure is good to live in it. Yeah, it is. Look at all those trees out in the garden. Yeah, I see all those trees. Well, you serpent, you little wonderful thing, you. So he started on the positive. Get the attention. Yes, sir. Has God said you shall not eat every tree of the garden? Did God say that to you? Why? I can hardly believe that. Shucks. <laughs> I can hardly believe that. God didn't tell you that, would he? Oh, boy. He said, well, the woman thought, well, hmm, I don't know. Did God say that, didn't he? Well, let me see here. Let's see. And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. See, she was positive. She gave back what was given to her. She gave the instruction that God gave. Now, it doesn't say here that Eve got the instruction. Adam did. But Adam, you can deduce from this, Adam told Eve about it. So here, this serpent here now, or Satan was using this serpent, was more subtle because he didn't tell the truth than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, and notice his attitude and his approach, Yes, yes, sir, boy, this is wonderful. God is so good. He started on the positive. Yes, sir, isn't this wonderful to be living now? Breathe that air a little bit. Ah, boy, doesn't that feel good? Boy, doesn't it feel good to live? Oh, it sure does. See, the whole lot isn't written there. That's in First Ernest 2 7. But he talked to him on the positive. Yes, sir, it sure is good to live in it. Yeah, it is. Look at all those trees out in the garden. Yeah, I see all those trees. Well, you serpent, you little wonderful thing, you. So he started on the positive. Get the attention. Yes, sir. Has God said you shall not eat every tree of the garden? Did God say that to you? Why, I can hardly believe that. Shucks. <laughs> I can hardly believe that. God wouldn't tell you that, would he? Oh, boy. He said, well, the woman thought, well, mm, I don't know. Did God say that, didn't he? Well, let me see here. Let's see. And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. See, she was positive. She gave back what was given to her. She gave the instruction that God gave. Now, it doesn't say here that Eve got the instruction, Adam did. But Adam, you can deduce from this, Adam told Eve about it. So uh, she says, well, you know, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. And there's nothing wrong with that. But of, the tree of the tr uh, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So that's what God's in that real feminine Eve voice she had. Well, I wish I could duplicate that, girls, for you, but I can't. I mean, she had a beautiful, not seductive, that's the wrong word. She had a beautiful voice. Oh, the clarity of Eve's voice. I could sit under the apple tree and listen to her all day. <laughs> Feminine tones in that voice are just marvelous. And girls, we'll talk about that maybe later if I remember it. 
about some of you, how you answer the phone. Yeah! And I say, this is Mr. Ernest. Oh, Mr. Ernest. Hi. So sometimes girls, and I think God gave you gals a very pleasant voice. We men like to hear your voices, and I hope you like to hear our voices. But some of us, you don't need to work on that. So here, here she was in that beautiful tone of voice, and I wish I could have heard it. Maybe someday we will. She gave back the instruction that uh, God had given to Adam and Adam to her. Verse 4, And the serpent said to the woman, Anna, come on now. See, so he didn't come right out. He just kind of toyed with it, played with it a little bit. Anna, come on now. You know better than that. God's not going to treat you that way. You're not going to die, are you? I mean, breathe that air again. That's it. Breathe that air. Doesn't it feel good to live? Oh, isn't that wonderful? Well, you know, God wouldn't kill you. He created you to live. Why would you die? So he said, Surely you're not going to die. For God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you'll be like God's, knowing good and evil. And won't that be wonderful for you? And the woman, now when she saw the tree was good for food, so she didn't leave it at that, which she should have. He lured her on, caught her attention, and she said, Well, well, uh, Hmm, let's see. I think I will take just a peek. Just a little look. That's all I want. I won't, I won't get too close to him. Just a little peek. She looked over and she said, Mmm, my, it does look like a nice looking tree. Isn't that wonderful? And since you thought about it, I mean, you brought it to my attention. Well, my, the woman saw the tree was good for food. And it was pleasant to the eyes. See, we girls like dresses, don't we? Pants, suits, and so forth, and window shop, don't we, girls? Sure we do. We love to see A-lines and all kinds of different lines and, uh, and you know, hymns and uh, whatever else there are, darts and jarts and everything else. We love that as girls. We love to look at all those things in different fashions. They go, the fashions just drive me crazy. Up, down, up, down, up, down, you know. It's amazing, you guys. I tell my wife, keep what was 10 years old, keep it. It'll be around in 10 more years, you know. So up, down, up, down, the fashions. It was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise. So she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. See, she did it. She knew better. Now, God instructed, but she knew better. And gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. So, dolting at him there, you say, he should have been the leader. God created him such, but he was going, oh, 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 the next tree, oh, oh, you know. He was looking at her, hey, that's kind of nice, you know. And who knows what she, you know, what she told him or, you know, what kind of a lure she gave to him. I don't know. I wasn't there. I wish I could see that. But uh, I'd like to see Adam, not Eve necessarily, but I'd like to see Adam, what he looked like. But anyway, you know, what kind of, uh, what she said to him, it doesn't tell us, doesn't tell us all the details. But anyway, he was along, he took with her, see, took the fruit, and he should have been the leader and said, no, I'm not going to do that, and Eve, you shouldn't either. But he didn't do that. He didn't have the character at this time. So he did eat also. Now verse 9. The Lord God called unto Adam, this was now after they did this, took the fruit, and they sinned, they went against God. The Lord God called Adam and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. That's funny. He wasn't afraid before this. He talked to God before this. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Now, I want you to notice something here. I don't know if you, this isn't new truth, by the way. This is minor truth. <laughs> I want you to notice something here that I noticed just recently. And maybe you've noticed it already, maybe you haven't. In verse 11, you notice God's approach. Let's look and learn something from God about his approach to Adam, then Eve, and then Satan. God did not accuse. He said, who told you that you were naked? Now, God knows all things. He knew, you know, what happened. But he asked the question, have you eaten of the tree whereof I command you not that you should not eat of it? See, God did not make a declarative statement. He asked a question. Have you done it? God knew already. To see what Adam would say. So he asked the question. God didn't accuse. The man said, see, here, here was Adam now. Let's notice the lack of character he had. Adam said, the woman that you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. See the lack of character there? He didn't do what he knew to do. To know and to do. He knew better, but he didn't do it. Now verse 13. See God's approach to Eve. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that you've done? Ask the question now. What is this you've done? And the woman said, what? She says, God, I repent. I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. She didn't say that. She was just like Adam. She was weak and vulnerable to sin also. She said, and the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. 
Yeah, that's right. The serpent kind of tricked a little bit. He kind of uh, provoked and he tempted, but he did not force. That word is not applicable here. He did not force her to do it. But he did work with her on it a little bit. And the Lord God, in verse 14 now, notice his approach to the serpent. The Lord God said unto the serpent. See, he didn't ask here because he knew who the culprit was, who was the author, the instigator of the problems. So you notice God's attitude is a little bit different. Does not ask. Does not leave room for it. He makes a declarative statement. He says, because you have done this. Didn't ask him if he did it, like he asked the other two. Because you've done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above all beasts of the field. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And so forth it goes. So we find, brethren, as we're taking a chronicle here of different events, Satan didn't do too well. The demons didn't do too well. Adam and Eve didn't do too well so far. And that kind of hurts a little bit, doesn't it? If we can view the life experience a little bit the way God does, it kind of hurts a little bit, doesn't it? Things still aren't going too well. Now we have to notice early mankind in Genesis chapter 6. Early mankind, Genesis chapter 6. First of all, verses 1 through 3. Genesis chapter 6. Man's been living on the earth a number of hundreds of years now. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, that is human beings, not angels, sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose, not that God said, but that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Does that give you a little bit of insight about God's attitude now about mankind? He didn't say that my uh, spirit shall not always just love and everything is just wonderful here with mankind, everything is going well. didn't say that, did he? You can see now what, what the problem was here. It wasn't with God, of course. It was with mankind himself. And he said, my spirit shall not always. Now, how long is always again? 6,000 years is a long time, but that's not always. My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also of the flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. I'm going to put a governor on his life, basically, and allow him to live about a hundred and twenty years. Maybe some exceptions, but basically that's going to be it. And then later on, David tells us about seventy years. Exceptions, yes, but generally about seventy is all you're going to get. So then we find, skipping down to verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Boy, that tells you about man. He wasn't doing too well at this point, was he? And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Boy, he was sorry, not necessarily that he created man, but that man turned out so lousy because God does not create inferior products. But God created the choice for man, and man's not doing too well at this point in his juncture of living on the earth, is he? Man's not doing too well. He's corrupting his way. So it grieved God in his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the first face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. I feel awful sorry that I made man because he's not doing too well. Then verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth, or corrupted God's way. They weren't living the way God wanted them to. And boy, things are negative. Things are gloomy. Things are down. That's terrible that there's so many losers. And God is so perfect, and yet God has got so many losers. Isn't that a terrible feeling? All these losers so far, not doing God's will, not building character. Now we have to go to another being, in this case, in the plural, a nation. Now we're ready to go to a nation, Israel. And you know what's coming, don't you? Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24. So most individual beings didn't do too well, so God destroyed all of them except eight in a flood. Because God was not happy with their lack of character building. Now God decided he was going to work with a nation and he would call them out as we understand very clearly and make them special to him and to Jesus Christ. 
So in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 3, Moses came and he told the people all the words of the eternal and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, read, read those words for me in your own Bible. Would you brethren, right there in verse 3 where I left off for you? Read that there and see what you think of that. Notice what they said. All the words which the eternal has said, what? What did they say? You reading it, are you? We will do. Yes, God. God, yes. Yes, sir, God, we'll do it. You say it and we'll do it. We'll know and we'll do, God. Yes, sir, God, we'll do it. That's what they said, didn't they, brethren? That's what Israel said she would do. Verse 7 and 8 now. Verse 7. Moses took the book of the covenant. He read in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Eternal has said we will do and be obedient. Isn't that beautiful how good it sounded? I wonder what thoughts went in Christ's mind as the God of the Old Testament at this time when he saw this taking place. I don't know. I wonder. Do you think God was real positive about this? Do you think... He'd say, well, you know, we lost a lot of them, but now we've got a new winner here. We've got a nation. I guess they'll obey me and they'll be faithful to me. And uh, what sure sounds good, doesn't it, God, the Father? The Father, doesn't it sound good that they, that they say now they're going to go ahead and be obedient? Now we better go ahead and go ahead and solidify the covenant now with them. And so the solidification came here in verse 8. Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. And he said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. So verse 8 is very important. 7 and 8 shows you in the Old Testament where the Old Covenant is ratified. Right there it is. If you want to mark that. Right there it is. 7 and 8. That's when all before this, we have the Ten Commandments before this, the judgments and statutes all going out, chapters 21, 2, 3, and 4 now. All the precepts, all of the to know... All of it to know what they needed to know was being given to them. And they answered, Yay, Lord, we will do it. See? And then the blood, you see, because without blood there's no forgiveness of sin, that went ahead and solidified the knowing and the doing, and they said, Yay, Lord, we will do it. And that's what they said. Now we turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Notice one other little ingredient here with Israel. How good God is, and how flawless God is, and how wonderful He is. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. Same author, Moses writing, shall come to pass if, and notice the word there now, if you shall hearken diligently, not slovingly, not lazily, not laodiceanly, but if you would hearken diligently unto the voice of the eternal your God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all nations of the earth. People query that. People question that. And they say God is not fair because God made him special. It's not fair if you're dealing on a physical plane, but when you're God, it is fair, isn't it? Because God is God, and secondarily, God knows the beginning from the end, and everyone will be given a chance. For from God's point of view, it was fair. But you notice, to be special to him as a nation, they couldn't just be special and do nothing. They had to produce and do. They had to be diligent to God and hearken to his voice. He's going to set them up on high above all the nations. Verse 2, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, if you shall hearken unto the voice of your Lord your God. And then verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 12 tell us specifically how God was going to bless that nation. But I don't need to read the other verses and scriptures. You know what happened to Israel, don't you? They were taken into captivity and God spanked them hard. And later Judah was taken into captivity because Judah did not listen either. They said they would do. They knew, but they did not do. And that was the problem. It was not that they did not know. They knew but they forsook God, especially in regard to Sabbath, in regard to sexual sins, uh, spiritual adultery, with other going after other gods that don't even exist, and so forth. So now we see, through the example of Satan, 
demons, Adam and Eve, mankind before the flood, and a chosen nation, Israel, all knew what to do, but they didn't do the right. They knew, but they didn't do. Now let's take a little bit of a look and insight about our nature. Speaking in general terms, our nature is men and women. Exodus chapter 3. I'm not Exodus, Ecclesiastes, I'm sorry. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Let's notice just a little bit about a commentary about mankind or a commentary on man's life and his dealings and his doings and what he does. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Here Solomon writes, as we heard last night, so very, very importantly and very clearly last night, a tremendous Bible study, really enjoyed that, learned a lot from that. We learned that in Ecclesiastes, everything is vanity, and then you have to put in the phrase, apart from God, as we learned last night, which is very true. Everything is not vanity, but apart from God, it is. It's temporal, it's not lasting. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 16. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said in my heart concerning the estate, the condition of the sons of men, that if only God would manifest to them, and if they might only be able to see themselves that they are but beasts apart from God. They are but just human individuals, and apart from God, cut off from God, they're just like beasts. And Solomon wants us to understand that, and God, more importantly, wants us to understand that. Now, chapter 8 of the same book, chapter 8 and verse 11, we'll see another reason why, it's not the only reason, but another reason why man oftentimes will do evil, and why, you know, we in the church sometimes will do certain things that may be wrong. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Because you don't get your hand slapped right then as you're doing wrong. Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Because the punishment is not meted out immediately, mankind thinks he can get away with it. And as we heard in the sermonette, he develops habits of, well, so what? Policeman didn't see me do that, so maybe I can do it again. And then we get into criminal, criminal areas, you know, and then we can talk about it from a spiritual plane. Well, God didn't strike me dead. And we may not mean to do wrong, but sometimes we get into wrong habits about doing wrong. Now let's notice in the New Testament the same point now about mankind. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. A little about our nature. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 5. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, the natural, automatic, normal mind, is against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And we are in the flesh, but we do have an ingredient that it doesn't talk about right here, but it does in verse 9. We have that ingredient. Now, sin destroys character. Now, all is not, so far it's been a very negative picture, isn't it? People aren't doing too well. Let's notice two quick examples of beings who did well. And then we're going to get to someone else who's quite important to God. Let's notice quickly now in Genesis chapter 6. We were there earlier. Genesis chapter 6 verses 8 and 9. Back to the example before the flood. This is Genesis chapter 6 verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the eternal. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and a perfect, no, that's not right, Noah was not perfect. It means he was upright and sincere is what it means. 
Noah was upright and sincere in his generations, and Noah walked with God, meaning he must have talked with God, he walked with God. Now, Genesis chapter 17, another being. Noah did a nice job of listening to God and obeying God. Now we notice another being very important to all of us. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Abram was 99 years old when the Eternal appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be you, same word again, Hebrew, same word, be you upright and sincere. Chapter 18, verse 19. Now there in chapter 17, Abram was 90, uh, it says 99. And then we find chapter 18, verse 19. Here is a comment God has to make about Abraham. He says, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the eternal, you know, follow God's way, to do justice and judgment, that the eternal may bring upon Adam or Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Now here he's still 99. But you find out earlier, Abraham was 77 when God first called him. So... God had 24 years to look this man over before he made the comment about him and said, this man is good, upright and sincere, and he'll do what I want him to do. Here's a winner for a change. I've got a winner here. And because of that obedience, I'm going to make him the father of all these great nations. And the father said, that's good. That's very good. Are you sure? Jesus Christ, Lord God, are you sure we have a winner here? And he said, yes. We've got a winner. I've watched him. I've observed him. I've seen him. I've seen him in action. We've got a winner here. And yet, he still did what? What did the man do? Yeah. Backslid, fell down, stumbled, fumbled around a few times because he was still flesh. But overall, his heart was right. Now, brethren, you know, it's been kind of a negative picture in that Things don't look too good. Now we come to some very important people to God today. Abraham and Noah and Daniel, a lot of the great men of the Bible are very important to God, but they are sleeping now, resting. God is not dealing with them. But God is dealing with an awesome group today, and they're very, very important in God's sight. And that's you, brethren. That's you. And you knew it was coming, didn't you? You knew it had to be applicable somewhere along the line. It was too easy to listen about others and to find out how they fared and how they did. That was too easy, wasn't it, brethren? Now we have to ask ourselves the question about building that godlike character. We have to ask ourselves the question what is the Father and the Son saying? What are they talking about in regard to his church today and individual members in that body of Jesus Christ? What are they saying? Christ is the intermediary between the Father and us. And he says, I, uh, he, he sits at God's right hand making intercessory for us or being the intercessory, making intercession for us, telling the Father that they are weak vulnerable to sin, but God, they will grow and they will produce and they will build that character. Are you building God-like character? I feel you are. I think you are. I believe you are. I have trust that you are. But we cannot just say I'm satisfied with the level I've already built. Because we know, brethren, we know that our reward will be commiserate with the amount of characters, individuals, we have grown and produced in our own lives. And no one can do it for you. No, I can't do it for you. Jesus, the Savior, can't do it for you. None of us in the ministry who love you very much and spend our prayers, our lives, we sacrifice our lives for you, and we do that through our time. That's all we have. I have not money. I have time. That's all I have. We do. All your brothers in the ministry, seated over here in seven, this section over here, we're the ones who love you and spend time with you and work with you so you can build that character. And we try to help you any way we can. We can only do our part. And we appreciate that that you've done to inspire us and encourage us by your growth, by the character you've built.
But we cannot let down and say, I've had enough, I've built enough, I'm ready, I have an abundance of character, and I know I'll have an awesome reward. Even Mr. Herbert Armstrong himself, who's built more character than anyone I know living now, has been at it a lot longer. He does not take that attitude, and I know he does not, that he's built enough. He does not say that. So if he says he does not do that, how in the world can I say I've built enough? We must continue on. Now, brethren, we must conclude with the question again, why does God want you to build God-like character? Because God wants you to be like God. He wants you to be in his very family. He wants you to be God. And when you are God, you won't sin anymore. So now is the training ground in our lives today where God can observe us and see if we not only know which the ministry have been teaching us the know. They have all been teaching us what we need to know. And they've been faithful in that. But brethren, the other part of the knowing is what? That's right. It's the doing. We all have, we all have to do to build a character. God wants you to build character because he wants you in his family. He wants you to live forever and be very God. Brethren, please don't let God down.